There's a common set of questions that strategy teachers typically ask about this uh, dynamics material. And the first of these is, why do I need to add this to what I teach about strategy at all? Now there's a longer video about this, but this is just a summary of the answer to that question. Established strategy frameworks essentially answer questions about where in an industry a company ought to compete, given the industry conditions, the market opportunities, how you're going to compete in that position, what exactly you're going to offer to whom, what the value proposition is, and so on, and go on to answer questions about where exactly you're going to get competitive advantage from, what resources and capabilities, for example, or how is your business model unique or more powerful than your competitors. So all of those questions are essentially giving you an answer to what is the best positioning of your business in its competitive environment. We do need more, though, because what we then have to do is understand how to manage strategy over time. Having chosen that position, you have continually to make choices as the market competition and business itself actually change all the time. And you've got to do it across all functions and decisions, holistically across the business. And I'm afraid you have to do it quantitatively as well. When you make decisions and uh, choose actions, you're choosing what to do, when, how much. And you also want to know what results are going to come out of that. So the extra thing we need is to understand about implementation. What am I going to do to deliver this strategy? And what likely performance am I going to get out of that? How does strategy dynamics help add that important extra dimension to strategy teaching? Well, if we think about those standard strategy answers, they are essentially based on uh, decades of, of research into answering the question about why some firms are more profitable than others. So if we look at the distribution of profitability in an industry, in this chart, you've got the number and size of companies in the industry stacked up in each of those bars. And each bar is a profitability band. So on the left, you've got some small companies making losses. And on the far right, you've got one company making a very high rate of profitability. And in the middle, you've got a mix of large companies, medium companies and small companies making less profit, moderate profits and, and more profit. So the standard strategy tools for looking at the attractiveness of an industry or a segment within an industry are essentially giving you that picture. Is this industry or is this segment one in which it's possible to make high rates of profitability or do competitive conditions mean that it's actually very difficult to make high rates of profitability and quite easy to lose money? So that's telling you about the industry or the segment itself. The other standard strategy tools then come into play to help you understand how to achieve a better than average profitability. So in the highlighted position there, you are both a reasonably substantial business and your profitability is higher than the average. Now, those are useful, and important questions, but they have some significant limitations. First of all, the answers to those questions very rarely change you get more or less the same answer, whether you pose those questions today or last year or sometimes five years or 10 years or even more years ago. And when it comes to finding a way of achieving better than average profitability, successful firms simply do not keep changing their mind about what they do. If we think about all the wonderful case examples that we love to talk about in our strategy classes, whether it's Ikea or Amazon or Toyota or Ryanair, you would get essentially the same answer to those questions today as you would have done if you'd done the same analysis with the same tools five years ago or 10 years ago, or in some cases even 30 or 40 years ago. There's nothing fundamentally different about what Ikea does today, for example, compared with when they started way back in the last century. So they are useful questions and the answers to them are important, but those answers don't change very often. Secondly, many firms in the industry choose the same segment and the same position, but with vastly differing results. If you look at the low fare airline sector, for example, there are dozens of low fare airlines, but some of those are absolutely huge with hundreds and hundreds of routes and hundreds of aircraft and actually doing quite well. There are many mid-sized ones that are doing quite well, but are nothing like the same scale. And there are small ones that come and go and make losses. 
So the attractiveness of the industry and the position you choose kind of aren't enough to explain those vastly differing results from the strategy. The uh, next point is that actually investors aren't interested in this number anyway. What they want is they want growth in cash profits from the business because that's where they get paid out their dividends and that's what determines growth in their stock price. So they aren't interested in these ratios. They want to see profitable and sustainable growth. And once again, the, these uh, tools have not very much to say about how exactly to implement the strategy. The answers management needs in addition then are first of all to explain why their profits have got to the point where they are today. And it's important to appreciate that historic events and decisions are not just of academic interest, they are really important because they do explain where you are today and they are already going to explain something of what's going to happen in the future. Take a simple example, if you decided a year ago to develop a new product for an attractive market, which will take two years to complete, then your profitability from one year out in the future will be different because of that decision that you took 12 months ago. Conversely, if taking that market requires you to have many more experienced people and you did not hire them two years ago and they need three years of experience, then you aren't going to have the people that would be necessary to make that product successful. So historic events and decisions explain today and they are already in the process of explaining something of what's going to happen to you in the future. So if we look out to that future, we next need to answer where are we going given the external events that might happen to us and what if our decisions haven't actually been all that good? I mean, in this particular case, are our profits going to continue going down out into the future? And the last question we want to answer is how can we better manage those external events and make better decisions over time across the whole organisation and lead to a better future? This is very much looking at a profit over time chart. Strictly speaking, if we talk to our finance friends, we'll find out that what we really ought to be looking at for strategic performance for investors is growth in free cash flow. But for simple terms, we'll, we'll talk about profit. But that's not always the performance we're pursuing. We often pursue other aims, both in business cases and in non-commercial cases. You might want, for example, to take a large fraction of the potential customers in a new market you're trying to enter. You are doing that because you want profit, but you expect that profitability to come through later. So your immediate aim is to capture that uh, customer base. And in non-commercial cases, it might be nothing to do with profit at all. Amnesty International, for example, probably has objectives for reducing the number of people who are in unjustified uh, imprisonment around the world. That's a perfectly valid objective, but it has not anything to do with profit. You can also have objectives that apply for the whole organisation. Profit for a whole company or numbers of people in prison for Amnesty International is an objective for the whole organisation. But you may have objectives also for a particular functional department. Marketing may have objectives to capture a certain number of customers or um, the service department may have a, an objective for improving the service quality of what they do for your customers. What management need from strategy then is, yes, they do need to answer that question of positioning. Who am I trying to serve with what and how? But then they need help in putting together a time phased action plan. What am I going to do? How much, when, in all functions, with what outcomes? And how am I going to adapt that continually as events unfold? And if they get a good and confident answer to that, then they want good and confident answers to what's likely to happen to the growth in cash flow that will come out of those action plans over time. As I say, there's also a more extensive video on this, uh, why strategy needs dynamics.